Current time is now 7.27 p.m. here in Seoul, South Korea. It's time for Me to Korea with uh, Professor John DeMoya joining us in the studio. Professor DeMoya, hello to you. Thanks very much for having me. You know, we're talking about the MJs. Yes, I heard, overheard part of that, yeah. Who's your favorite MJ? Um, I'll be honest, I'm going to go blank in bigger things, but in the ones you just named, um, probably uh, Mick Jagger. Mick um, Jagger. And if you saw the, the greatest picture this past week with Alain Delon unfortunately passing away, mm -hmm. the great picture they ran in all the newspapers was Alain Delon sitting next to Marianne Faithful in the late 60s, and Mick Jagger with his hands in his head... In the one time he wasn't the main man in the room, and that's what I, that's why I made me think of it. I like the fact that Mick Jagger was outshined by a far cry by Alain Delon, the the hot French guy. We had some answers. Michael Johnson. Remember Michael Johnson? Oh, the sprinter. Yes, that's right. 96. 96. Yeah, he's kind of disappeared, but yes, for a brief time he was the man. Man, I was. So someone said Mary Jane for Spider. Mike Judge for me, ladies and gentlemen. Okay, yeah, yeah, Mike yeah. Judge. He, he's he's a brilliant guy too. Yeah, King of the Hill is one of my favorite. No, the, the real favorite. answer, of course, would be uh, Michael Jordan. There's no question about it. Uh, there's Michael Jackson. There's Magic Johnson. I'd still go there's with. Another. I'd still go with Michael Jordan. I don't like Michael Jordan. Um, I grew up with the <laughs> Six Bulls titles, so I, I did, did too. But I, I don't defer. like. <laughs> oh, I I don't know if I'd like him personally, but I defer to the right. legacy. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, today yeah. we're going to be talking about a very interesting. Uh, aspect of Korea's history. I mentioned this is this is probably one of my favorite movies. Like top three favorite movies. If I could watch a movie over and over and over again, this would be one of the movies. Okay. I don't know that I'd go that far, but I have seen it several times. I, I have weird movie taste. Yeah, okay. Uh, Shimido. Yeah. Shimido back in 2004. Um, I mean, it was a very popular movie. Uh, but we're going to be talking about what exactly happened in this right. island What's the story behind the film? And it's very important to get the actual <laughs> true story of what happened. Because if you only watch the movie like I did, you're not going to, you're going to get basically the, the dramatized version sure. of things here. But what started all this is something that we probably mentioned many times on the show. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Something that happened on January 1968. At the Chongwade sparked all this. Let's give a reminder for all of our listeners what exactly happened in January 1968. Sure. This was the Blue House raid with the 31 North Korean commandos known as Unit 124. They get within uh, several hundred meters of the Blue House. Um, the famous story about them reportedly being discovered by some Korean policemen and then Apparently, they said enough to either indicate or even directly told them like that they were there. And then, anyway, most of them end up getting rousted and rounded up, and only I think one gets back. But this, of course, the fact that they came so close triggers um, all kinds of um, concerns in the Korean government. And as we will discuss, almost immediately uh, puts in the mind of Truck, Park Jung Hee and others, "Wow, we should uh, respond to this." Yeah. And and this is where we'll go. Knowing Park Jung Hee, yes. How dare you try to you kill failed, me? You failed, but but the very fact that you thought of doing this. Right, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so let's go to the film again. Okay. Shin Mi Do. Uh, sure. If any of our listeners have never watched the film, it's, it's a good watch. I mean, it really is a very good movie, to be honest with you. What's the story in the film Shin Mi Do? Okay. Um... The story of the film is the response, uh, the formation of a team of, again, uh, I believe the numbers are roughly similar, you know, so, uh, some like 30 uh, South Koreans. Um, they are, as described, uh, petty criminals, career criminals, guys who gangsters. really don't... Yeah, gangsters, guys who don't have a lot going for them. So they are essentially given a deal, said, we're going to train you in this little island outside of Incheon out there. Uh, hence the title, and we're going to prepare you for ultimately a mission that will take you to North Korea to respond to what just happened. This, of course, does not happen, uh, and in the film, and as we will discuss later in real life, it's similar, um, the ones who have remained through the training over about two to three years, because this is, takes us to August 71, um, managed to escape the island, uh, actually get to Incheon, actually get pretty far into side Seoul, where they are surrounded by policemen, and in the film, a very dramatic... Uh, uh, when they recognize they're not going to get to North Korea, the government is not going to recognize them or give voice to their concerns. Um, I think they set off a bunch of grenades, and there's a kind of a dramatic, yeah. massive ex series that's of explosions. That's, that's part where I cried. Yeah, and this is where they, at least in the, the film, if I remember correctly, it's depict they they die very heroically, having uh, failed, but nonetheless having given their all for this effort. Uh, we've got a uh, bunch of couple of people over in the UK asking, uh, how do you spell Shilmido? It's S-I-L-M-I-D-O. Yes. Shilmido. Um, it didn't help that they were dressed like North Korean 
uh, guerrilla yes. <laughs> soldiers. Yes. Oh, uh, and for, 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 I'm sorry. That, and there that is, is, there that is, is a reason. That is an important detail. Yes. Because that was imagine? that was how they were going to infiltrate. But in Seoul, that set off some concerns. Right. I mean, can you imagine how people would think like in Incheon and in Seoul because they basically take a bus and they're going yeah, in. Yeah, right, they like, hijacked a bus. Yes. Right, and they're yes, going. Yes. Oh my goodness, there's a bunch of North Korean soldiers. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and you can imagine how implausible it would have been if they'd said, "By the way, we're actually not North Koreans, but we're on a mission from Park Chung Hee." And, yeah, yeah, and, <laughs> and you can trust us. And I think, <laughs> despite the, the way we're dressed, I think the way that the news goes is it goes that story goes confidential, and the story that goes out is that it was North Korean yeah, soldiers. Yeah, yeah, they, they definitely suppress it both yeah. in the movie and in real life, and that's why, as we'll talk, the actual story doesn't come out until the early two thousands with the film and later. So, what percent? Of the movie, would you say roughly is based on the actual incident? Sure. From reading, as we'll talk a little bit about the novelist who first brought the story out and the film, there's basically three versions. Uh, whatever happened, which we'll put in brackets, yes. the novelization, which apparently uh, to, from reading online and from his account is like only 30% of it is represented in the film. Oh, wow. But in terms of the actual incident, I think a lot of it, the basic outlines of the story are there, it's just the exaggerated um, details and the kind of the over dramatization and glorification of these guys as heroes is definitely probably not in the novel and 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 then also probably not as close to the reality yeah and so both the movie and the actual history in itself uh it's centered on unit 684 yes okay let's talk about what unit 684 was and who composed the yeah, members yeah. of these units at, le 684. at least according to the online accounts and also according to the novelist who we'll talk about in a moment uh Baek dong ho yeah these were as you said gangsters petty criminals they're described as being people who were frequently in street fights and so again not a lot going to so, some people who are like in death row yes yeah, so right. socially marginalized or career criminals yeah. and essentially where the government not you're going to get a commuted sentence but in essence you have a chance to contribute to the nation and it's again i believe the numbers are low 30 as i've seen like 31 they go through this period of training roughly from at least they're formed really early on like january february 68 and they train all the way through 71 um, I don't know at what point they decided that they're not actually going to get to go. But apparently the part that is real, it's to your question, for the movie, apparently seven of them did die during the training. So yeah. it was really hardcore. Uh, you're going to be sent on a death mission. And by the way, you should be physically fit for that. Oh, right? absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So so that's if it's like 31, that's almost a quarter of them die in the training. And I mean, you have to imagine that, uh, you know, Probably some of them are smokers, and they're not the most yeah, fit yeah, people. Yeah, exactly. And they're These running. Are not, exactly. These are not guys who are all of a sudden waking up at 5 a.m. and no. doing drills all day long. Yeah. But then you can imagine what would happen if you go years of the same training, shooting training, yeah. just hand-to-hand uh, -hand combat, uh, running, swimming, going underwater, all that crazy stuff that's you know like Navy SEALs go through. Yeah. yeah. Imagine Thank going you. That's through. A good, that's a great yeah, analogy. I, imagine going through years of that. Eventually, you're going to make super soldiers. Was yeah, what yeah. the plan was. Um, you talked about the novel yeah, yeah. that kind of sparked the movie, right? Yeah. I mean, the the real story, sure. then the novel, and then the movie. Sure. Who is the novelist Peck Dong Ho? Yeah, this, Hall, this was new to me, and I actually I, this is one of the reasons I love doing this. Um, he apparently has also a, a history as a kind of uh, low level career criminal, and um, spends time in Korean prison, arrested a number of times. Oh, the novelist too. Yeah, yeah, and this is where apparently where he gets the story. Oh, wow. to, to flesh it out, where he so he claims. I mean, uh, he gets out in '94 and he writes a first thing, which is a prison memoir. Claims that one of the guys, the story about all the. Uh, uh, trainees having been killed is not true claims that he gets to meet one of them or through a filtered narrative in prison and that's where he first hears it and he comes out of prison starts researching it developing it and that's where he publishes in uh, 99 the novel which is of the same title but I mean, in his accounts the story that we know in the movie is only like 30 percent of the plot and a lot of the other plot is his prison experience and more his prison life and that the story we know is embedded sort of in that and that's where the director took that story and because i don't remember anything about the prison or anything like that right 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 yeah but his version is that he learned it or overheard it directly or indirectly from someone who had survived and the korean government had thrown into sort of long-term incarceration see and that's the other thing is it's like how much of that would be true too no no right? we don't know that's yeah exactly, exactly we, we don't know exactly yeah, and then yeah, yeah. you're getting basically stories from i mean exactly the you could be in prison and I don't, i've never been to prison but you could be Imagine if you're there for a really long Precisely. time, you're bored off your mind, and you're going to come up with stories that's going to entertain people. Yeah, right? I mean, yeah, you yeah, see yeah, some yeah, of these prisoners, yeah. if you see any of these documentaries, a lot of these people are good storytellers. Yeah, yeah. That's how they spend their time. 
That, that's what he, keeps him sane. What he said that his motivation was, he said as someone who felt wrongly imprisoned that he immediately identified with the story and felt the personal resonance, even though he was only a short-term uh, sentence, he felt the same resonance as this story needs to be told regardless of you know how much I actually find out. Yeah, exactly. And so, I mean, you have basically the... It's unclassified now. Is is it unclassified? Um, at least, and we'll get to Partially, that. But, yeah, we'll get yeah, to that. At part. least the government of, uh, apologized in the end in the early 2010s. So yes, in that level, um, I don't know if they put out the reports and things, but they have acknowledged it. Yes. Yeah, because the way that the movie ends, and I'm kind of sure that that's how it really did happen, is they get the report on what exactly happened on Shinmido. Uh, unit uh, 684, yeah. what happened to them and the truth. And it closes off as classified to have a full yeah, yeah, classified. Yeah, they definitely do not let it go down no. in 1971. <laughs> no. So they're basically going, it's going to be, it's a bunch of North Koreans who infiltrated South Korea again yeah, yeah. and were able but to this, catch them. But this is a perfect story, perfect story to a historian where this guy hears pieces of this story in the mid-1990s, almost 25 years later. And he's like, oh, I've heard these rumors. I had no idea that this was actually. So, right, we can never get to the whole thing, but we can see it filtering out over the years. So let's talk about what we know is to be true and maybe not based on the movie. Okay. But what happened in 1970? Because it's, it's in August. I believe it's like yes, August, August 23rd, 23rd, I think, or something yes, like that. Yes, yes, so yes. So tomorrow is the anniversary of what has kind of happens. Correct. Um, the North Korea plan, right? These guys, basically, they're super soldiers now. But and, it's truncated. They're they're never given any indication yeah. that they're ever going to go. And, and you yeah. know what? And in some ways, there some of them are brainwashed, right? To going, man, we're going to go in They've there. They've been training three and a half years. Yeah, we're going to be able to kill Kim Il Sung. Yeah, they, we're, we're capable of doing this. And some in you know, some weird personal way, even though I was a career criminal, I redeemed myself. Oh, absolutely. Because yeah. for these people, if they come out successive uh, successful with this, they're saying, I'm going to be. Basically, the greatest thing to come out in my family and yeah, stuff. Yeah, I'm going to be no, buried I, at national it, it, it's cemeteries. A very, it's a very heroic way of transforming yeah. their personal circumstances. Exactly. Yeah. But it gets canceled. Yeah. Right? We talked about a number of occasions in this program why the, the reciprocal mission to kill Kim Il Sung was canceled. Um, we do, well, no, and I, I say I don't have an answer, but the usual possible. Yeah, the usual interpretations will be along the lines of uh, North South relations were getting a little bit better. They recognized that just as they had responded this way, that maybe this will go in an ongoing series of things that will be not productive for anyone. It's gonna basically reignite yeah, the Korean they sort War of have, again. They sort of, yeah, they start they start having second thoughts and they're like, yeah, maybe this isn't such a brilliant idea. <laughs> And the 71 was not a very good time for the U.S. to get involved with any they're other conflicts. The, I hadn't thought about it, but yes, they're in the process of withdrawing from Vietnam. Nixon has already made his Guam speech in 69. And, and you know, next... South you, Korea has troops in Vietnam. Right. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. you don't want Nixon to come out and go, by the way, we've just kind of, we're withdrawing from Vietnam, but we're going to enter another war. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. There, it, it would it would be entail so many other considerations, so yes. And so yes. we don't have the actual truth as to why yeah. all of a sudden they decided not to go forth with this. But you can imagine the kind of leader that Park Chung-hee was he was upset. There must have been some sort of mission in order to, you know, reciprocate yeah. this and this kill. This is with three years hindsight and kind of like, yeah, yeah, we've got these guys in training, but um, uh, I don't know if I want to push the button. What happens once they cancel it? Okay, uh, two things. And you've already brought up rightly that they know they're not going to be going. The other thing I've heard from both Bex accounts and others is that not that that just irritated them, but then they thought basically and they kind of realized, rightly, we're not going to get off this island. They're no. not going to commute us and put us back into general prison or ever let us go. So either way, we have no future. So yeah, what we know is true is that they do manage to get off Inchon by killing, I'm sorry, um, the island, Shilmido first, kill a number of their guards, uh, get them get from uh, Shilmido to uh, Inchon. From Inchon, uh, I don't know whether they immediately hijack the bus, but somewhere in there they get a bus that takes them to what is described in some context, because I don't have the exact location, but I've seen it described as Southwest Seoul. I've also heard near Tongjok, but somewhere south of the river. Yeah. And at that point, I don't know whether they were headed to the Blue House or to some or to Yongsan, right. but they get cut off and surrounded by police who are probably told, as you said, there's a bunch of North Koreans who have infiltrated from Inchon. And, and, and this know, is plausible. And you know what? You have to understand that inside the bus are hostile too. Yes, I'm sorry. Yes, there are. Right? Yes, all and this so, stuff is all this stuff is basically. And so true. you have witnesses, and yeah. we have witnesses, and basically, when you witnesses see that they're wearing North Korean soldier <laughs> yeah. uniforms, you're not going to stop to ask questions and get <laughs> no. context. No. But um, the part that's a little bit different, and this yeah. again is the counts, is is that. Um, 
uh, let's see, there's so 31, uh, seven are killed during training, so it's 24, roughly mid-20s. Uh, only a few of them survive the ultimate shoot, shoot out with police and things. Yeah. Uh, where Beck has complained is he said he definitely did not like the hand grenades and the kind of glorification. That, that so, was the drama. So he, so he yeah. apparently says that was overdone. And then the other thing is about, I think it's four of them survive, or, or five or six, it's single digits. Those ones who survive in the movie and other accounts, it said that they all um, were hung or, or dealt yeah. with. Beck insists that at least one of them survived. And again, he claims to have either met directly or indirectly one of these individuals in prison. Again, we can't confirm but we can't, this. Yeah, we can't confirm that. But that's, that's his version. Right. But that's his narrative anyway, just to put it out there. Yeah. Because no, I mean, we, we can't confirm this. I, I can't imagine. And I'm sure those stories circulated in Korean prisons for years in different forms. Even if there were survivors of that. Yeah. Right. And they were, you know, imprisoned or let's say they were even released. But they're not going to put you in general population where you can talk. Yeah. And even, well, they, they could be like, listen, you can, if you talk, we'll find you. Yeah. And, and more we'll, importantly, if we talk, we'll put you in isolation and yeah. you'll put you in a dark room for 30 years. So well, why would you like just enjoy your life and shut up? Right. And just and, and so there's probably people going, I'm just going to shut up now. You know, yeah. this is yeah. I got the good part here. Yeah. I have freedom now. As long as I keep my mouth shut, I can't. Im- that's the that's the reason why I can't imagine how credible. I, no, I agree. He, he next story he, would he, be. He clearly is someone who's writing a novel, and he succeeded in not only get selling books, but also getting it turned into a movie. So yes, he does have a uh, he does have an agenda. Yeah, but you have to understand that just the broader picture here, the fact that there was this unit, oh, uh, yeah, 684, which we have and yeah. we'll get to, it, has been confirmed. Yeah. Shinmi Do, all that stuff, you know, that's been confirmed. This is all truth here. But again, these other stories, and it, it, it was such a heart break when I found out too that whole grenade episode scene was all fake because that was the part where I was like oh man <laughs> yeah I don't, I don't remember my initial reaction again I watched it on v- I'm sorry this is an old uh, technology I watched it on VCD I did not watch it in the theater but then I went back and watched it several times both for Korean language learning and also again for this was my first introduction to that particular period of history when family members yep. later found out uh, what happened, sure. right? Um, I could imagine there would be some sort of legal yeah, yeah. And, moves, and, legal measures uh, put in place. Post the movie, uh, I don't know when they start the case, but it has to be after 2003, 2004. Yeah. And they get uh, successfully um, uh, a verdict around 2009, 2010. I don't remember the exact amount, but they do get compensation from the government and they ultimately do get uh, some form of apology or recognition from the government that yes, this happened and we probably maybe should not have coerced your family members in this particular way. So, you know, and I mean, it, not that this it compensates in any way, but at least the government at that time did come clean on the basic affirming that, like, this, yes, this has happened, and we do actually owe you some form of, yeah. The, the, I mean, there's so many mysteries to this, right? Because like you said, I mean, it's not like it's fully... It's not fully, you know, unclassified now, and you can as read far this. As, I, as far as I know, yeah yeah, 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 yeah. It's not like you could go up on the internet and then find out no, about what you're exactly not happened. Shimido incident report. 19, yeah, no. yeah, no, and, no, and no. even if you do Wikipedia and stuff like that, you're basically gonna get what is based on, like the movie or the novel and stuff like that. Precisely. And, and some... It's it's filtered through multiple layers of discourse. Yeah, and, and this, and I'll be honest, historians love like, this. It's like the telephone game. <laughs> yes, precisely. Right? I like that. I like there, that. It's yes. a telephone game. You, there's but, a kernel of truth, but it's surrounded by multiple narratives. But my thing. Yeah. is when the family members were able to get some sort of compensation for this sure they must have found out that their sons oh yeah that's the, that's precisely that, that that's why they i'm sure they identified those people whose family members were actually in but the then box. the thing is when they were going to shimido the yeah. island the deal was is that the family members don't know about this well that's what i think what the apology was for was not just about what happened in the bus and the suppression for the years but the fact that by the way, do you remember that like 35 years ago? You're, 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 so the government actually went to them and be like, by the way. No, I, I don't know how they did it that, but when they were forced in court, they probably then, yeah. I, because no one knew who these people were. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm sure. I'm sure it was under the pressure of the court, not that the government voluntarily... Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And so that's the thing. And again, just a reminder, this is all after the movie has come out and there's all this publicity and people are asking questions in a very different Korea in the early 2000s, which is precisely one of the useful things about democratization is you can at least ask questions. Right. And so the big thing here <laughs> yeah. is that the South Korean government, I mean, albeit many years down the yeah, road. Yeah, many but, years down the road. But, but yeah. you know, 60s, 70s, 80s was a very different uh, Korea yeah. at the time that you weren't going to get some sort of apology from the government for what happened and also it was kind of a big secret yeah. uh, all these things that happened 
the South Korean government did end up apologizing. Yeah, they end up that. apologizing, and we get some sort of a legal resolution. So even if we don't have a full sense of the story, there is at least some sense of a coming together and at least talking about it and opening up part, partially. You know, it's so funny. We're getting a lot of uh, comments in, uh, from our listeners out there. Okay. Uh, <laughs> First and foremost, a crash override over in uh, Michigan. He says, this honestly sounds like a Seth Rogen comedy. <laughs> if this professor <laughs> okay. weren't here explaining it, I would not believe a word of it. But um, that's just the thing, yeah, right? And also, no, but just to emphasize, that's beautiful. You forget that the Park Chung-hee, and just to remind us, uh, that, that he's uh, president from, what, 61 till 79. Uh, he, particularly in the early 70s, once you hit the Yushin Constitution, pretty much what he says is law. It's yeah. a, a very different country. Yeah, that's yeah. to keep it simple. There's, Very different country, total autocracy. And, and the interesting, again, I mean, we don't know if that's what happened in the film is true, right. but some of the training soldiers, yeah. the, uh, the, the, what is it, the training officers. Oh, yes, and some of the guards survived too, so they at least gave accounts. Uh, yeah, and that's yeah, the yeah, thing yeah, yeah, is yeah. because like, they, they spent in the, the island, yeah, yeah. they spent in the island together for like three years. Yeah, they years. had that people who were there both when they were training and also when they escaped and when they killed some of them, they didn't kill all of them. Yes. Right, and so they, they, there was yes. a bond, let's face it, there yeah, was yeah, a yeah, bond. Because yeah. these guys also had, I never thought about it, you're right, they also had weird lives where you're basically sitting around the sound watching these guys for 24 hours. And there's also a scene where one of the main uh, officers was against the idea of killing off everybody. Sure. And so I don't know what happened to him. No, but I'm sure there was some sympathy generated over the years. Sure. This is incredible. Very quickly here... What does the story tell us, tell us about how the South Korean society have changed over time? Um, I would affirm the things we talked about at the end. The fact that there was a legal case that actually got some compensation for the families. The fact that government came out and apologized. I do read that as at least, and the fact that the movie was made. Mm-hmm. I think these are all signs that South Korea, particularly post-87, but moving into the early 2000s, was becoming a very different country where you could at least talk about these things and discuss them and is become the country that it is today that still has problems but still talks about these much more openly again for our listeners out there we don't again like at least according to the novelist only 30 percent of the movie is factual yeah, he, but he, he's complaining about but, it a lot but then listen the thing is the broad <laughs> story itself is right. factual oh, absolutely check out shimmy though yeah, yeah, one of my film. favorite yeah, movies yeah. out there it's a fun one watch it over the weekend professor demoya thank you as always for your history lessons have a fantastic rest of your week We'll see you again next Thanks week. Thanks very much. You can listen to Korea Now with me, SJ Lee, by downloading the Arirang Radio application or tune in online by visiting www.arirangradio.com. So make sure you tune in Mondays through Fridays, 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. Korea time.